thanks and uh, thanks to the organizers for giving me an opportunity to speak and for organizing this very nice workshop. So, um, yeah, so as Robert mentions, I'm going to tell you something about the non-integrable Ising field theory. This is work done with Andrew, the previous speaker, and also Robert. Um, so the big picture of, uh, of this talk is going to be that uh, the usual assumption about a non-integrable system thermalizing and an integrable system not is not really the complete story. And uh, one of the ways we're going to tackle this is using truncated Hamiltonian methods. So I'm going to start with a pretty general introduction motivation to non-equilibrium, just because it's a fairly mixed community. We've heard a lot this week already, and uh, uh, I feel it's good to uh, get everyone on the same page. And then I'll kind of go through uh, some details. What is uh, eigenstate <coughs> thermalization hypothesis and how this is related to thermalization? I will explicitly show that the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis is violated in the non-integrable easing field theory. Uh, and then I'll discuss some consequences for non-equilibrium uh, and give some conclusions. So uh, this is the final talk of the conference. The very first talk of the conference by Gabor also uh, discussed maybe some of these topics or in passing. Uh, yes, OK. So the kind of problem that we're thinking about is how does a generic uh, quantum system uh, time evolve. So uh, I'm thinking of how to compute quantities such as this, where psi is not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. So um, I'm going to be considering the case where we have isolated quantum systems, so it's unitary time evolution, uh, reasonable Hamiltonians, so the lattice model that I will explicitly consider is a local lattice model. Um, we're going to prepare the system in some state, the ground state or an eigenstate of some Hamiltonian, and then change the Hamiltonian and time evolve. Uh, and then we're going to compute expectation values and see what happens. Um, so there's kind of all sorts of questions that one can ask about such a, about such a problem. So we have our time evolved state. And you can ask questions such as, uh, does the system relax? Uh, do expectation values have a well-defined long time limit? And if they do have a well-defined long time limit, uh, can it be described by a statistical ensemble? And if so, which one? <coughs> uh, so some of these questions are really easy to answer just by uh, very uh, basic arguments. So for example, does the system relax? Well, we have a unitary time evolution. If we construct the density matrix, there are always oscillatory terms, so the system as a whole cannot relax. However, it's widely believed that subsystems uh, can relax. So that's uh, if I focus on some small region of my system and integrate out uh, its complement, the system as a whole can relax in the sense that the reduced density matrix relaxes to something uh, that's constant in time in the long time limit. Do expectation values have a long time limit? Well, it's really, really easy to construct operators that don't have a well-defined long time limit. So the most obvious example is if we construct a Hermitian operator that's just the projector between two different eigenstates, this will always oscillate. Uh, so there's some provisos to this. Generally, it's believed that local operators, uh, their expectation values uh, have a long time limit, and this basically coincides with the fact that a local subsystem has a long time limit. And then uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this statistical ensemble. So why, so why do we kind of ask these kind of questions? Um, so uh, I'll go back to some motivation from uh, 12 years ago now. So in, in 2006, uh, there was uh, a really elegant and beautiful experiment by uh, Kinoshita Wenger and Weiss 
called the quantum Newton's cradle. So this is a pretty well uh, a pretty well known experiment now, and it kind of kicked off the whole field of study of non-equilibrium quantum systems. And one of the really nice things about this experiment is, is it's really extremely simple. Um, and it really revealed a kind of profound lack of understanding of formalization and what happens in non-equilibrium. So I just want to kind of very briefly sketch what they do in the experiment. I'm not an experimentalist, so this will be a kind of a theorist take on what the experimentalists do. But I think it captures essentially the correct picture. OK. so. Uh, David Weiss's group uh, studies cold atomic gases, so they uh, com so they take some uh, some bosons that interact essentially via a delta function potential, a purely local interaction, and cool them down to low temperatures, and place them in a trap. So they have some kind of confining parabolic trap that uh, that their gas sits in. So in equilibrium, they have some gas that's distributed in the bottom of their potential. Then they apply uh, a Bragg pulse. So what the Bragg pulse does is it splits this gas into two. It makes wave packets of momentum k and minus k. And those wave packets move away from the origin and go up the sides of the potential. So they start their experiments with some uh, collection of bosons here and collections of bosons here. Uh, so after this Bragg pulse, they separate, they go up the sides of the potential, and when their potential energy, when their kinetic energy is completely converted to potential energy, they fall back down. <coughs> so when they do this, uh, they, they fall down and collide at the bottom of the trap. So uh, they collide, and then one wants to see what happens. So uh, the grand insight of this experiment is that they tried this in two particular scenarios. They tried it when this gas was confined uh, to a 3D parabolic trap, and they also uh, tried it when it was confined to a one-dimensional parabolic trap. So in 3D, the result is really very simple. Uh, so they start with some momentum distribution function of their particles that's strongly peaked at two, two separate and equal, uh, sep uh, opposite values of the momenta. And after about three collisions, so three oscillations in this experiment where they move back and forth in the trap, they get something that looks like a thermal blob. So, so they get something that looks nice, which looks pretty similar to what they would get if they just prepared their, their gas uh, in the trap to begin with and didn't do this Bragg pulse. So that's after about three collisions in 3D. In 1D, uh, they did precisely the same. So they started with nice sharply peaked momentum distribution functions. And then they did this experiment, and they waited, and they uh, kept examining what was going on. and. I think, for example, in, in their paper, they show some plots from after 400 scatterings, roughly. And they end up with some momentum distribution function that looks really non-thermal. It has extra peaks. And basically, these peaks remain. Uh, for really uh, long times, basically as long as they could run their experiments. And these, experiment, uh, these experiments being in cold atomic gases really last milliseconds or seconds. So it's really an extremely uh, long time scale for a quantum system. But yeah, so 400 scatterings, and this was kind of a lower bound on possibly the, the thermalization time. So one of the major questions is, OK, this seems like a simple experiment, and all we've done is restrict the dimensions. Why does 3D thermalize really rapidly within three collisions? But 1D seems to not thermalize, at least for any time scales we can reach in experiments. Um, and one of the central insights was uh, to look at 1D and consider what they're actually doing. They have delta function interacting bosons. 
delta function interacting bosons in 1D are an integrable system. So uh, it's an integrable system. This means that there are many, many conservation laws. There, is, there are as many local conservation laws as there are degrees of freedom. And this strongly restricts the dynamics. And this uh, avoids thermalization. And there's been really kind of 10, 12 years of work to understand all the, uh, the intricacies of this statement. So integrability avoids thermalization. Is it like fine-tuned integrability? So uh, that's, a, that's actually a really good question. I mean, th this is a real experiment, right? They break integrability in lots of man right. manners. So for example, uh, the 1D Bose gas is integrable, but it's integrable when it's translationally invariant. Here they've put it in a trap, integrability's broken. Somehow it seems that certain types of integrability breaking matter and certain types don't. And this is also still something that's under uh, a large amount of study. In fact, myself, Robert, uh, maybe Andreas has also studied these, these issues also go more, sorry. So, um, so say, don't you mean that they will never thermalize or yeah. just the time scales so, are very long? So that's one of the questions. So uh, in an, uh, an actually integrable system, uh, it won't thermalize. Right. We understand what it relaxes to, and I'll mention this in, in just a second. So, so this set of experiments really kind of led to an understanding that somehow there's some kind of dichotomy in uh, quantum systems uh, where we split them into non-integrable and integrable. And then we can say various things uh, about them. So let me just kind of summarize what our, our kind of basic knowledge of these systems is. So, so it's, it's widely believed that non-integrable systems thermalize in the sense that if I uh, dump energy into my system and wait long enough, the energy redistributes in such a manner that uh, subsystems and expectation values look thermal. So um, the long time limit of some local uh, expectation value is reproduced by some trace over a thermal density matrix. where, for example, if you only have energy conservation, this is your typical thermal uh, density matrix. Um, and this temperature, so beta 1 upon t, is fixed by the energy of the initial state that you start in. So uh, you do something, you dump energy into your system, you start in some uh, non-eigen state, but energy has to be conserved by unitary time evolution. So um, we can fix uh, the Lagrange multiplier here by, by measuring the expectation value of the Hamiltonian that's doing the time evolution in the initial state and uh, computing uh, this. So we, uh, we completely uh, fix everything. This is in a system where I'm just assuming energy is conserved. Okay, so um, in integrable systems, uh, things are different. We've already seen in this uh, quantum Newton's cradle experiment that uh, the system doesn't thermalize, but we, we do believe, and we, uh, we have explicit calculations of that by uh, many people in the room. So they uh, equilibrate. Um, expectation values have a well-defined long time limit, or local expectation values have a well-defined long time limit and we also um, understand after some uh, debate and effort uh, what uh, this statistical ensemble that describes the uh, expectation values is or the, uh, the reduced density matrix of a subsystem is the reduced density matrix uh, is the reduced density matrix of this density matrix. And here, uh, this is what's called the generalized Gibbs ensemble. The thermal ensemble is known as the Gibbs ensemble. So it's generalized because now you have to include all of your conservation laws. So basically you introduce Lagrange multipliers for every local or quasi-local conservation law in your system. And uh,
So integrable systems possess, uh, possess a set of uh, conserved quantities Q. They commute with one another and with the Hamiltonian, and you can construct the density matrix. And these Lagrange multipliers are fixed in exactly the same manner as for the thermal ensemble. Can I ask you something? Why do you care whether they're local or, or Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, uh, so... Is it because you actually have a, a physical environment and you're assuming that somehow the local ones are more likely to be... Uh, well, I mean, so any quantum system has an, ex uh, an exponentially large number of conserved quantities, right? It's the projectors onto the eigenstates. So one should ask, like, can't we just do that for the thermal case? It has to be correct as well, right? Um, however, uh, yeah, okay, this is not 100% something I want to get into, but yeah, you can say if I'm interested in local observables, I'm going to have some intuition that local conservation laws are going to be what's important. It actually turned out, and Gabor was very... Uh, important in understanding this is that in certain systems there are new classes of conserved quantities and integrable systems, quasi-local, they actually have some decaying finite extent which were not really uh, appreciated or realized previously and you have to include these in certain scenarios as well. So there's some subtleties but it, it's not really the point of my talk so maybe we can chat afterwards. And yeah, okay, so we can fix these Lagrange multipliers in, in an identical manner, these are conserved quantities so uh, we compute the, the expectation value of these conserved quantities on the initial state, and we can and this fixes uh, yeah these Lagrange multipliers. We can construct the generalized Gibbs ensemble, and we can predict what long time expectation values of, of operators uh, are. So this has been checked quite quite thoroughly. Um, this was how it was realized. You have to include quasi-local conservation laws, etc. So, okay, so this seems like a pretty nice story, and I should mention that there were uh, uh, there were really uh, kind of seminal contributions to this by people like Marcus Regal uh, and some of his collaborators, where this was really uh, appreciated and realized over kind of uh, 2007, 2008. So, okay, so non-integrable systems fermalize, and this is what we see in 3D. Integrable systems don't, but they equilibrate, and we can understand what this equilibration is. So you can just ask quite simply, is this the full story? Because to be honest, it would seem a little bit surprising that there's a single partition into integrable and non-integrable, and all non-integrable systems, no matter how different they are, behave similarly. Uh, so this has been something that I've worked on for quite a while. We understand what happens if you weakly break integrability in some sense of weak. Um, and now I'm going to present you an example where integrability is broken, but in some cases the system doesn't formalize. So part of this story was actually understood quite a long time ago with the uh, eigenstate formalization hypothesis. So I just want to mention uh, this here. So the eigenstate formalization hypothesis is a hypothesis, as it says in the name. And uh, it's a set of conditions on eigenstates and also observables that we believe leads to observables looking like they're thermal. So this. This was, uh, this came out of work by Deutsch in 91 and also Srednicki in uh, 94. And I'm going to write this on a board and keep it up here because it's important for the rest of the talk. So, uh, yeah, so the statement is the following. So for some arbitrary uh, state, uh, expectation values of an operator will approach their thermal values I'm sorry. Uh, if, and there's two conditions. So the first is uh, diagonal matrix elements of the operator in the eigenbasis. Uh, 
uh, if these diagonal matrix elements are smooth functions of the energy of the eigenstates. The second point is the off-diagonal matrix elements should be exponentially small in the system size in the eigenbasis. Basis, you mean energy eigenbasis? Yes, yes. Uh, the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian under which you're doing time evolution. So this can be summarized in a simple formula. So does that mean for a condition one, it makes sense you need a continuous spectrum? You can't have a discrete spectrum of energy? Um, you can think of this in a discrete spectrum as well. Um, so when this is usually studied on the lattice, you, because this is a statement about generic uh, eigenstates, you do exact diagonalization. And what one looks for is that the spread of operator expectation values at a given energy is, uh, is sharpening up with system size or Hilbert space dimension. So, uh, so. So this is believed to be sufficient for, uh, for thermalization. And there's at least examples in lattice models where, where this holds and we can compute non-equilibrium dynamics and see that uh, long time expectation values uh, in systems that satisfy ETH uh, are thermal. So, so you're not saying anything about O bar alpha beta. You're not making additional requirements. Because some people, you know, yes. some random matrix parameterization of this, but that. Yeah, that's so necessary. I'm not going to say anything strongly about it. And in fact, I'm not going to talk about off diagonal matrix elements at all. Okay. Um, I'm going to show the first condition is violated um, in the easing, uh, non integrable easing theory. Um, but yeah, there are all sorts of other things you can look at with off diagonal matrix elements. So, okay, so this. But how can you check these conditions in practice? Uh, you can go away and compute. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to use truncated spectrum methods to compute this. Well, why are these conditions easier to check than just what they imply? Well, how do you um, compute the full non-equilibrium time, uh, time evolution and go to the long time limit? Yeah, uh, although I'll show you some way in which we can check these as well. So, um. so these are not local operators? So these, there's no statement about the locality of these operators, but I, my general belief is that if these are non-local operators, these conditions won't be satisfied. But uh, I have no rigorous um, statement for that. This is a, for local operators, you want the off-diagonal matrix elements to be go to zero in the infinite volume that what's R, the, the size of your system? Yes. yes. But then, so, can I construct a local operator that doesn't change the energy? Um, so what I will show you is... Um, so what I will show you... Uh, okay, uh, this question I haven't thought carefully about. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so I have computed off-diagonal matrix elements in eigenbasis, and, and you can show that uh, for reasonable operators, they can be small. I haven't done super detailed finite size scaling analysis, but uh, um, yeah. Uh, so m the focus of my talk, and actually most people who do exact diagonalization on lattices, is checking point one, and then so. Okay. So now I want to show you that um, this is violated in the non-integrable easing field theory. So. Um, and then I'll say a little bit about why I'm interested in the non-integrable easing field theory as well. So, uh, <coughs> so. 
So the particular case I'll be considering, uh, I think was partially shown by Andrew in the previous talk. So here I'm just gonna explicitly include uh, the speed of light. So I'm going to consider massive easing, so perturbed away from the critical point, also perturbed by the spin operator. So um, this is uh, non-integrable away from the massless limit and away from the absence of the spin operator. Um, so this was partially mentioned by Andrew, but one of the reasons why I'm interested in this as a, as a condensed matter physicist is that maybe I'm interested in going the opposite way to many of the talks that have been given at this conference where I'm interested in using the field theory to understand a bit more about the lattice. So there's a related lattice model to this field theory, um, which, let me, which is a simple spin chain. which is very simple, it's just a transverse field easing model with an additional longitudinal field. And uh, one of the reasons I'm interested in this is that this model is really realized to a good precision in some materials. So um, there's uh, some, uh, a, a rather beautiful realization of this model in cobalt niobiate where various uh, aspects of the field theory were kind of examined in neutron scattering, so they saw meson masses, they can see that the, massive, the masses of the first two mesons, uh, the ratio of them approach is the golden ratio as you approach the critical point. Um, and there's also a, some, uh, some material that I won't really uh, consider too much, where it's kind of an anti-ferromagnetic realization of this model as well. So the field theory that we're considering emerges in some scaling limit close to the quantum critical point of this uh, <coughs> simple lattice model. And uh, as a condensed matter physicist, uh, I have much more intuition about the lattice, so I can just sketch out quickly what adding a longitudinal field does. Uh, Andrew covered this quite, quite nicely. So in the absence of a longitudinal field, you have deconfined spin-ons. So in the ordered phase, on which I will focus the rest of the talk, you can form domains with just a, a single cost of essentially violating uh, two bonds. So energy approximate, uh, approximately related to 2J, and then they can move around because you, only you, you can move it and you only break a, a uh, two bonds uh, when you move these around. However, for H non-zero, including even the case of kind of infinitesimally small H, uh, one has a kind of profound uh, restructuring of the theory. So now we have these domain walls, which in the H equals zero case are our low energy quasi-particles, but now there is an energy cost to moving domain walls apart, proportional to proportional to the, the distance between the two domain walls. This leads to a confinement transition, and in terms of the spectrum in the field theory, for example, uh, we move from a case where we have a nice continuum of excitations from twice the, uh, the excitation mass and mass to where we only have a continuum from four times the excitation mass, and then we have discrete meson-like modes that come from the linearly confining potential. This still holds in the, the absence of integrability. So, okay. So returning to the field theory, the kind of uh, path forward is clear, as I already mentioned to Slava, we will solve this with truncated spectrum methods. So here we'll really use the massive 
uh, the massive non-interacting theory as our computational basis. Matrix elements of uh, the spin operator in this basis are, are well known for 20 or 25 years, I think. Um, oh no, sorry, 15 years. Um, and we do supplement some of these truncated spectrum methods with uh, numerical renormalization group uh, methods, which haven't really been discussed, so I thought I would just very briefly outline uh, NRG, which is complementary to many of the NLO techniques uh, that have been discussed already. So numerical renormalization group is really easy to add on to truncated spectrum methods. It requires a, a little bit of motivation. So you imagine ordering your, your massive fermion basis via energy. And usually what we do in, in truncated spectrum is uh, so we introduce some energy cutoff lambda, disregard all the states above lambda, and diagonalize our Hamiltonian. Um, numerical renormalization group uh, techniques, which uh, Robert and some of his collaborators uh, have used extensively with truncated spectrum methods, uh, allow one to take into account states above the cutoff in a kind of well-defined numerical way. So the idea is you introduce some number of states you want to keep in your Hamiltonian or some energy cutoff, and then you, you divide the rest of your Hilbert space up into, uh, into uh, groups of uh, basis states, and you use the fact that the, relevant, uh, the perturbation is strongly relevant. Uh, means that uh, states down here are coupled progressively weaker and weaker to this, uh, the higher and higher states. Then one does uh, a simple, in step one, you take an n by n matrix, and, uh, which is generally dense, uh, and diagonalize it. Uh, in step two, you say, okay, let's throw away some delta n of the highest energy eigenstates. So, um, so we've thrown away the highest delta n eigenstates constructed in our truncated spectrum methods, and now we add in the next uh, delta n basis states. So then you end up with a, a Hamiltonian that's kind of dense. You diagonalize. And you can rinse and repeat this procedure. So you can just iteratively do this step after step after step and really include very, very many uh, basis states. This allows you to get convergence of your low-lying spectrum. Uh, uh, it, it allows you to converge uh, many, many low-lying states. Yes, so do you have to throw out once you, or do you, do you throw out the delta N, the lowest delta N, the highest delta N eigenvalues <coughs> once you've done this? Yes. Yeah, so you just progressively construct the, mat uh, the matrix, you throw away the highest states, introduce the next number of basis states, re-diagonalize and rinse and repeat. So this is really motivated by Wilson's NRG um, approach to the condo problem. In the condo problem, you have a natural uh, separation of energy scales because you map the condo problem to a spin that's coupled to electrons with hopping that decreases the further you go from your spin. Here we kind of have a natural emergence, uh, emergent uh, separation of energy scales from the relevancy of the operator, but it's a yes, similar a general idea. question about this method. I mean, for, for ETH, you're interested in highly excited states by definition, right? And so, uh, I mean, whereas this method is good for, I mean, as you say, for the low states where... I, I mean, so you can get convergence of really many states. Okay. Hundreds, thousands are completely okay, so possible. I mean, of course, it's, it's a good question to ask because we're dealing with a field theory, we're dealing with truncated spectrum methods. Uh, we aren't, so at fixed system size, we're at finite energy density, but if we want to extrapolate to the infinite volume limit, we're not really. However, um, I'm gonna not address this issue, but uh, yeah, it is something one has to think about. Another thing to think about is that this is a, a relevant perturbation, right? So when we go to the UV, it's, uh, it vanishes. So we already know in the UV the theory is free. So ETH can't be true because it won't formalize because free system is integrable. So it only really makes sense to look at the low energy sector of this theory for formalization. But yeah, 
I agree. Uh, it, there's some, some, uh, some uh, subtleties one has to think about. So, um, okay, yes. So we do NRT. We can construct many low-lying states, and then we can compute expectation values of operators, and see whether expectation values of operators uh, in the eigenstates obey ETH or not. So address point one: Are diagonal matrix elements in the eigenbasis smooth functions of energy? So. Um, if I could get the screen. Oh, it's the big switch. No. Maybe. Okay, so let's just see. Yes. Okay, so I had a brief reminder of ETH, but it's on the board. So, yes, as I say, the path forward is clear. We construct eigenstates with truncated spectrum methods, use these to compute expectation values of observables, and we can also use the uh, eigenstates to construct the microcanonical ensemble and uh, see whether expectation values agree with the thermal result. Which, uh, so the microcanonical ensemble, if ETH is true, just says, uh, as my diagonal matrix elements are a smooth function of energy, I should be able to average over eigenstates within a small window and uh, find the thermal result. So, okay, so what kind of things do we actually get? So, um, one should ignore the right-hand side of these plots, essentially, because you get truncated uh, truncation effects, and these are for a number of system sizes, which are pretty large. I'm really going to focus on this one, where everything's clear. You have to do detailed finite size scaling and the higher ones. Um, so, what do we really see? So, we construct really a large number of eigenstates. I think there are Three and a half thousand in this plot, and you should probably ignore beyond energies here where there are strong truncation effects. And we see, well, we see two things. Uh, what is the coupling? What, where, what, what's oh, sorry, yeah, this is for like uh, G is 0.2, and the mass is equal to 1. So. Um, okay, so yeah, we construct states and we can measure eigenstate expectation values, so the diagonal part of. Um, of this expression, and we're measuring matrix elements of the uh, diagonal matrix elements in the eigenbasis of the spin operator. So I call these E, E eigenstate expectation values. So what we can really see is that there's a broad continuum, as we expect, which, uh, where essentially we can compute the microcanonical ensemble, as shown quite nicely in the higher system sizes. Uh, so it's a dense continuum where we can construct the microcanonical ensemble, so the thermal result, and we see that essentially this continuum here has uh, eigenstate expectation values that are consistent with the microcanonical ensemble. But we see uh, kind of a line of, uh, of states that persists above the continuum. Um, so yeah, let me see. Uh, yes, so these parts, basically eigenstate expectation values and the thermal result agree, and the error bars on this are showing the standard deviation of data averaged over. Um, whereas there are these kind of lines of states above, which are maybe most convincingly in the smallest system size, but we have some uh, better data for this now, where they're really well separated from the continuum. As you increase your cutoff energy, uh, they remain well separated from the continuum. And you might ask, well, what's going on here? Because this is in direct violation to ETH, because this should be a nice smooth function of energy, and clearly there's some other stuff going on above. So most states seem to be thermal, but there are some states that are well outside what one would expect for, for states that are going to be thermal. So, OK. So it's actually. How about also the subleading terms? Can you say something about them? Is it important? Uh, it has to converge exponentially. Uh, so this is something that I'm currently looking at. I haven't done the finite size scaling yet. So uh, for now, I think it's sufficient to show that one of these is, is violated. OK. So when one looks at this plot, there's kind of a pretty natural conjecture that one can make about the nature of these states. The low-lying spectrum, as I mentioned here, are mesons. So we're, I should have said we're in the zero momentum sector of the Hamiltonian, so we're really just examining along this vertical axis. One should always work in a given symmetry sector when checking uh, ETH, otherwise the results are a mess. Um, so we see, so we understand what the, low, uh, the lowest eigenstates of the system are. There are these meson excitations. 
And I mean, it's pretty natural considering they lie in a pretty straight line to just conjecture that these are probably me the higher meson excitations too. But notice that these uh, mesons are above the multi-meson continuum and they remain well separated. So why do you expect the straight line? What, what is, <coughs> do you expect I don't expect anything. I'm just, uh, this is a completely unfounded conjecture where you say, well, they're going in a straight line. Maybe we should think about whether these states here, as they appear to go in a straight line, are related to these states here. Oh. I'm going to show you some evidence that this is true. Yes. evidence, you know exactly what these states are, right? Yes, so we can construct them. I mean, we construct them exactly, although just looking at, t I mean, for me, looking at truncated spectrum wave functions is not so useful, but I, I'll give you some evidence for what these are. I'm going to support this conjecture. Okay? So, yes, yeah, so, so the, low, the lowest lying states are mesons, so they're pairs of domain rules with momentum p and minus p. And yeah, it's natural to guess that these states are just a continuation of the, the low lying mesons. So, as we construct the eigenstates, we can directly check this is true. So, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, plot, I have two pieces of evidence for them being the meson states. The first is these arrows are drawn at the energies at which uh, I can semi analytically compute from some Logikov and Fonseca uh, the energies of the mesons. And you can see basically, they lie very nicely on top. The second thing I can check is I have the, uh, the states, so I can just see are these two particle states essentially, because the mesons I expect to be majority two particle states, and this is what these green blobs here show. So what one should uh, see is that these green blobs match up with the position of the arrows and also the positions of the uh, eigenstate expectation values that are well separated from the thermal continuum. Can you please remind us this meson states, these excitations, why are they not decaying? So That's a good question. That's something that we're looking at because it's, it, it's not obvious why they should be well separated from the continuum. But according to this, all this work of the Malachikov, should they, do they have a finite heat or are they poles? Uh, so I think, so we're doing the lifetime calculation ourselves at the moment. I think we believe they have extremely long lifetimes, but maybe not infinite. But, uh, I don't think that have ever actually considered. Yeah, he's... Uh, he's they, there's no reason they shouldn't be yeah, at least not an infinite volume. Yeah, so, so that's a question. So when you look at the decay mechanism, you have delta functions, right? And in the finite volume, can you satisfy these delta functions? But there, yes, they probably can. So it may be in the finite volume, they have infinite lifetime, or they have very large lifetime in the finite, uh, the, in the finite volume, that's true. In the infinite volume, I, I'm not sure I have anything sensible to say. I think what you can say is that the lifetime here is very long. Yeah. Unreasonably long. Because of some because of some phase space suppression, because there's a high momentum. No, it, what, what are they? Yeah, I, so I would say suppression of the matrix elements themselves. Yeah. That would, would hybridize them with other with the So one thing that I, I would say is that uh, so if one was to say take take your lattice model <laughs> sorry. So, so take your lattice model and do neutron scattering. So it's precisely what they do in cobalt niobate. Mm -hmm. And uh, you compute dynamical spin-spin correlation functions. So you, and then you evaluate the Lehman spectral representation. These are like one term, and then you're summing over a ton of thermal states. So my belief would be that you wouldn't see these in equilibrium correlation functions. They're just, it's, it's a single state and they're washed out by the thermal continuum. What I will show you is that we have evidence, and Gabor also has, has, has evidence that in non-equilibrium, you can project strongly onto these states and see them in non-equilibrium. So. Okay, yeah, so. Okay, so, uh, yes. So, so far we've just looked at equilibrium or eigenstate expectation values. ETH is somehow a statement about, for some arbitrary state, if we time evolve, expectation values will approach thermal values. If these uh, things are satisfied, we've showed they aren't satisfied, so we should look at what happens for non-equilibrium. So, um, okay, so can I get the, uh, yes. So I just want to briefly mention what we do in uh, non-equilibrium. Um,
So now we're really going to consider non-equilibrium dynamics within the truncated space approach. And this was, uh, this is not uh, something new. Gabor um, presented a method uh, a year or two ago, 2016, I think, for doing this very nicely, uh, for computing real-time dynamics. Um, I may run out of time to talk about real-time dynamics, so I'll say what we do to check thermalization. So, um, I will present you evidence that in the long time limit, expectation values do not relax to their thermal result. And how do I compute the long time limit of expectation values? I'm going to compute the diagonal ensemble. So the diagonal ensemble is essentially motivated in the following way. I time evolve my wave function. I want to compute expectation values on this time evolved state. Uh, so yeah, I'm just going to insert a double, uh, a double sum over the Hilbert space. So I end up with some oscillatory pieces that take care of the time evolution operators. And then I have uh, <coughs> I have this expression. And then one can maybe time average. I'm just going to wave my hands a little and say in the uh, Long time limit, all the oscillatory pieces av uh, average or fluctuate away to zero. I don't really like time averaging, so, um, so let's say it's postulated that in the long time limit, these expectation values can be described by the single sum of just the diagonal terms. Okay, so this is something that we can explicitly construct within TCSA because we have, at least to some cutoff, our uh, eigenstates, um, and we can check convergence with cutoff, et cetera, and we find that the diagonal ensemble um, converges quite nicely. So, okay, so we can plot this, and then we also have our eigenstates, so we can, of course, construct the microcanonical ensemble by averaging over some energy window our eigenstates. So, um, we are going to compare the diagonal ensemble to the thermal prediction that's given by the microcanonical ensemble. So if I can get the <laughs> screen back, please. And yes, I should have used it. But is there any way you can check whether this diagonal ensemble Yes. I, if I get to it, I will show you that uh, we compute real-time dynamics. And you can see, at least for low-lying states, the diagonal ensemble is consistent with uh, the values that the real-time evolution is approaching. So something you're going to say what O is? Yes, uh, for me it's always going to be the spin operator. <laughs> so. Okay, so this is the kind of plot we can get. So first I should say neglect uh, the right-hand side of the plot again because there are strong truncation effects. Here what I do is I, I consider um, starting in the ground state, uh, so in eigenstates, so low-lying eigenstates, of my Hamiltonian with mass one and some small spin perturbation. And then I time evolve each of those eigenstates. So there are 32,000 states. Uh, I time evolve each of them according to uh, the Hamiltonian with the same mass, different magnetic field value. And I compute the diagonal ensemble and the microcanonical ensemble. Now this plot looks pretty much identical to the previous plot. Um, so what we see is for the vast majority of states that one starts from, they look thermal in the sense that the diagonal ensemble result, so the blue and the black uh, results, coincide with the microcanonical average. However, there are these bars of states above, the, uh, above this thermal continuum where you've started in some eigenstate, and that projects strongly onto rare states 
and they're nicely well separated. So quenches that start from certain sets of eigenstates don't fermalize. Um, okay, so, and you see that, uh, yes, we have various truncation effects. We get convergence at low, low energies. One has to work harder at, at higher energies. But this, uh, this separation between the thermal and non-thermal remains. And I believe Gabor also has calculations that are, that are similar. Basically, these meson states <coughs> seem to converge uh, very quickly. So, okay. Um, so this is the diagonal ensemble and the microeconomical ensemble. You can also ask, uh, what about real-time dynamics? So for real-time dynamics, we, we basically follow the procedure that Gabor outlined in 2016. We do some Chebyshev expansion of the time evolution operator and compute uh, dynamics. In this plot, I show basically just a few states from this plot I choose some particular energy density, and I plot a, a rare, the time evolution of a rare state, and I plot time evolution of states that are within this continuum. So the purple uh, result here is the time evolution uh, of one of the non-thermal states. Now here we see there are really large, slow oscillations, which actually I think implies the off-diagonal matrix elements for this state are large. Uh, and we see basically thermal states have much smaller amplitude oscillations and they really uh, relax much more quickly to their kind of diagonal ensemble results. So sorry, this plot hasn't come out crazily well, but there's a dotted yellow line here and that's the diagonal ensemble result for the yellow, um, for the yellow uh, time evolve, uh, the yellow time evolution. So we see that basically the diagonal ensemble and the time average of the yellow are in pretty good agreement. The time evolution of the blue and this blue is not so well, but uh, there's likely some convergence issues. And then there are some states which are on the kind of edge of the thermal spectrum that seem to time decay much, uh, seem to decay in time much more slowly and with larger amplitude oscillations, which probably implies that these are states that somehow have intermediate off-diagonal matrix elements when compared to these states and these states that settle very nicely. And this shaded region shows what we expect for the thermal result plus the standard deviation. And these states all have approximately the same energy? They all have the approximately the same energy within some small epsilon. So you, if these were all thermalizing, one should expect them all to lie within this uh, gray region. Yeah, and I should say this purple line here is the diagonal ensemble result for the rare state. So maybe actually the diagonal ensemble should be a bit higher, but it's hard to tell. Okay, so I have a couple of minutes, so maybe I'll just mention something kind of nice about doing these real-time dynamics that was, um, for me, motivated by Gabor's work on the lattice, uh, which is that one can take, say, the time evolution um, so here I start from the ground state and I do a small quench, so I mostly project onto low-lying mesons. You see there's a lot of structure to this, uh, to this time evolution, uh, very many frequencies of oscillation. Uh, essentially I have two cutoff uh, energies here and the results are very well converged for low-lying states. You can see the diagonal ensemble prediction agrees pretty well with the time average. Um, and what one can do is just take this, time evolve it for long times and do a Fourier transform. And this allows you really to do kind of spectroscopy on your mesons. So you get these uh, very strong peaks in your uh, power spectrum of your time evolution, and this allows you to pick out what the meson masses are. Uh, this was also done on the lattice by Gabor very nicely. So um, with that, let me just see. Yes, OK. So I have one minute. So uh, OK, so we get certain quenches that don't thermalize, even though this is a non-integrable model. One question that one can ask is, does this carry through at all into the lattice, or is this some funniness of the field theory? Um, so this is a really hard question to address, because uh, uh, in the field theory, you're in some particular scaling limit. Gabor spoke about this. He has some very nice results, but it's, it's really tough to get the correct uh, limit of the, of the uh, lattice. So we kind of took a slightly different approach, which is let's, uh, we kind of want to know whether this is generic. So can one see this away from the scaling limit? So we just did some lattice simulations. Actually, um, uh, 
motivated by some work by uh, Mario Kama uh, from 2011. So there they had a, a very nice result about uh, absence of thermalization on relatively short time scales where they examined uh, the reduced density matrix of the, the free body reduced density matrix of some uh, of their time evolved state and showed that it wasn't approaching the, the free body reduced density matrix of the thermal ensemble. Uh, personally, I don't have too much intuition about free body reduced density matrices, so we just uh, did some ITBD uh, calculations <coughs> of a quench from an initially polarized state along the x-axis, which is precisely the quench that was considered in this work, time evolved with a particular lattice, Hamiltonian, and we looked to see, okay, is, is there any signs that in this lattice model, which is completely non-integrable, um, that there might be an absence of thermalization? And what we find is, okay, we compute essentially the same observable. So we start in a completely polarized along the x-axis state. So we start from sigma z is equal to zero. We see we get a time evolution that takes us beyond the thermal result that we compute quite simply with exact diagonalization. And uh, we believe this is at least some supporting evidence that thermalization on the lattice uh, may be avoided in certain scenarios. Um, okay, so uh, with that, I will finish. So, uh, yeah, so to conclude, um, I think this dichotomy of non-integrable being thermalizing, integrable being non-thermalizing needs to be rethought or is at least not completely the full story. Um, Hamiltonian truncation is a, is a nice uh, tool and technique to tackle some of these problems in interesting non-integrable theories. Um, there's a question of how to go to finite energy in the, uh, in the thermodynamic limits uh, that uh, I think is still outstanding. I've presented you some evidence that the non-integrable Ising field theory violates ETH and this has real consequences for non-equilibrium dynamics. And uh, yeah, I think there's still uh, plenty to understand about thermalization. For example, ETH in a field theory, I still am not sure I entirely understand. Why? Because you might say that this is a statement for generic states, so states that are mid-spectrum on the lattice. But of course, there's no concept of mid-spectrum in a field theory. Um, I get two particle states infinitely far into my uh, theory. Um, I don't know how to interpret ETH uh, in, in this case. This, uh, this absence of thermalization, is it a feature of the field theory or is it a feature of confinement? And if it is a feature of confinement, does it happen in other confined theories? So, so, so here, it was, you know, I think it's important that, that the interaction is relevant and that you have yes, three guys absolutely. in the UV for this yes. feature. I mean, you, you could, you could I mean, QCD already does not show thermalization mm -hmm. in that in your yeah. definition, right? Yeah. You two protons come in and jets come out. Yeah. yeah. Right. So um, no, it's of course not integral. Yeah. Yes. So uh, yeah. Okay. So I think there's still plenty to understand about thermalization, and thanks for listening. It's clear that this, so you understand that there are these meson states and so on. If these meson states were exactly stable, then clearly they, on the one hand, it's clear that they would violate the exact thermalization, the exact thermalization. On the other hand, it's also clear that generically such things should not occur. So if they do occur in your theory, then, you know, perhaps you should just concentrate on why this happens in this theory. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, this is something that we're working on understanding. Yeah. Although, uh, although I would say to me, actually, personally, it's non-obvious that two meson states, <laughs> which, are, which are what we probe in the low energy part of the spectrum, are thermal. <laughs> like, why should two meson states be thermal? Yeah, that's another thing that uh, I was confused about, because yeah. I thought that it's only meaningful to ask these sort of questions for states which have 
finite energy density well, and everything good. If you have two mesons there, right, who cares? Exactly. I, think, I think what we see is that this is a reasonable question to ask because we do see ETH being valid for the vast majority of states. Now, I don't know why it's valid for the vast majority of states. I think that's something that needs to be understood. But uh, uh, naively, I would agree with you. Like, like at the low, the low lying part of the spectrum, I don't know generically that one should expect ETH to hold. And we can, of course, only target the low lying part of the spectrum. But the fact is, is that ETH does appear to hold for the low lying part of the spectrum in this theory. And I, I think that's something that we need to understand. Like, I would like to see whether this happens in, in other cases. But, uh, it's it's a non-obvious statement. I completely agree. Uh, I was not expecting to see ETH be valid. <laughs> there are there are people who claim a strong version of ETH yeah. applying to all of the states in the spectrum. Yeah, yeah. So 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 I didn't mention this, but yeah. So, so yeah. So so there's a weak version of ETH and a strong version of ETH. So weak version of ETH says you have rare states, but the number of rare states to the number of thermal states vanishes in the thermodynamic limits. Right? It's widely believed, and I think there's some evidence from Vincenzo Alba and others, that this, this applies in integrable models, this, this statement, that there are many states that are thermal in integrable models, and you have a spread of <coughs> non-thermal states, but there are more thermal than non-thermal states. Then there's a strong version of ETH, which is supposed to be sufficient to, to prove uh, thermalization, which is that there are no rare states in the thermodynamic limits. Now, there are some lattice models where it's seems suggestive that strong ETH can apply in certain scenarios. But uh, so for example, if you take this easing model and you go to some particularly weird couplings where these couplings are irrational, they seem to see strong ETH. But if you go to a different set of parameters, you see weak e ETH or signs of weak ETH. So it's kind of a mess. Uh, um, yeah, I don't know what m much else to say other than like uh, this is a tough problem because you need to study eigenstates, right? So what do you do? You have to do ED and then uh, you're restricted to low energy or you're restricted to tiny systems, even for Andreas. <coughs> so maybe you have some comments. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, uh, I think... I think some of these effects we, we actually have seen, I mean, not in the same language, but in some study of Jose, Jose Hubbard models and we had a, a work where we looked at, at also at like that overlaps for the particular question we looked at that we had like strong peaks of our signal on on states which we also called rare. We mm -hmm. were not the typical ones, mm -hmm. but that I think that's yeah. exactly what Gabor sees as well, uh, like strong overlap onto rare states uh, in certain scenarios. But the point is a bit I think if if, if you I mean in the particular spectrum we looked at, these are kind of these states are finite size. I mean, there are states on a fi finite volume, and if yeah. you look at it, but if you start to think, even if you cannot solve it, what happens with these bands and these structures as you yes. current consistent, if you actually conceptually start to think what happens if you're mm -hmm. at finite density, then you actually start to see these states start to overlap in energy with states close by, which actually are of a different nature, mm -hmm. and, and you, you have to start worrying what the matrix elements yeah, yeah, are. Absolutely. So I think absolutely. at some point, if you start to think in some even if it's not ex very specific in terms of the quantum Boltzmann equation, what do these, these meson states at finite density start to do? I think you, you have to work out what this so interaction this is, and, and, and even if yeah. there's a small matrix, I, mean, I think it's surprising that there are small matrix elements perhaps among them, but ultimately I think these systems would, would thermalize. I mean, I, yeah. that, that's yeah, my yeah. opinion. Yeah, I, yeah, I yeah, cannot yeah. prove it, but yeah. I, I think at some point if there's, if there's not this, a reason why there's no matrix elements which really protect them, I think ultimately they will have a very long time, but ultimately they will, they will thermalize. Yes, yeah. But it's very hard to see. And in this Bose Hubbard model, I think this question is still open. Yeah. I think we also understand why it seems non thermal. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, but but especially if the matrix element is small, yeah, 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 then yeah. you can show that they go, it's going to start thermalizing in perturbation theory. So, right. yeah, it's theoretically it's even adva advan advantageous when the matrix element is non zero but small. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, no, I think the key is that the, if the matrix element is small, that the meson states in the full theory do not hybridize strongly with the continuum and will sort of maintain a two, this, this two meson, this two quark character that they have, even in the <coughs> I think that's what you want to target for a calculation. Well, I want to say. No, but I, mean, what I understand kind of what you're saying, but I'm saying 
suppose that this suppose that you can show that this meson dk with a very small with a very long lifetime. Then um, by, by meson, then you mean sort of the, the meson is computed by the two quark approximation of the stem logic column thing for the sake of these equations. I mean, you can't construct the full excitation. Yeah, because uh, I, I guess that's, that's one of the uh, the issues. Is like, so okay, so you want to compute the lifetime of the mesons, right? What's the meson wave function that you want to compute for? You only know that approximately, yeah. right? So, is the lifetime that you compute a result of that approximate realization of the wave function, or is it a? So if one included contributions to all order, do you get a finite or an infinite lifetime? I, uh, I don't know what the answer to that question is. But uh, I think it's generically a tough one. To <laughs> I mean, the truncated spectrum computations show that... Yeah, I mean, the these, I mean these are... That, yeah. And that the mesons maintain... Well, yeah. I, mean, I mean, we construct well-converged low-lying eigenstates, right? By definition, eigenstates have infinite lifetime. Yeah. Now, how that... Uh, so what happens is you increase truncation, and finite size is a, is a tough problem, of course. You have to be really careful. But I mean, the states we construct have infinite lifetime within our truncation scheme. But, uh, but I agree. Is this a finite volume effect, I think, is a subtle, subtle question. Uh, also, so you, you don't two know first mesons would be absolutely stable. Sorry? Yeah. Sorry? The first mesons would be absolutely stable. Yeah, yeah of course, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> they are built <laughs> Sure. And, and uh, I also have a comment about the relevance of the few particle states. Namely, there's another parameter in the quenches in this game is the, is the density. How large is the density as compared to correlation length? Because if the density is too small, I mean, the average separation between particles is too large compared to the correlation length, then even a finite density quench is just a few particles going on X, on average. Sort of like exponentiates sort of like you unbox your system into very large boxes in which you have only a few particles occurring such that these boxes are already very, very large compared to correlation lengths. And in a field theory, that means that, field, that uh, finite size effects whatsoever are exponentially small. It's not clear that these finite size effects could, uh, could turn over your things, I mean, could, could initiate thermalization being exponentially small, already very, very, very small, extremely small. And, and, and also then your, this is what you see in our original TCI simulation, TCI simulation of time evolution, of which there are more to come actually very soon. So that finite, uh, few, few particle dynamics dominates lots of lots of quadratical quenches, actually. So these low-lying states, I mean, they are not dominated directly by few particles, but these few particle configurations separated by very large distances. So in a sense, the few particle contribution is what appears in the, in, in the result itself. But isn't that just saying that the time scale is again longer because it takes longer to actually... That's a question whether it is just saying that. I am I, I, I'm, I'm in two minds about that, whether it is just saying that the time, the time scale is where... If it's longer than the lifetime of the universe, you would never see it in an experiment, no. by the way. <laughs> right? So no, at, some I mean, point no. at some point it becomes about practically infinitely long time scales. That maybe theoretically your, your time scale is not infinite, but if it's too long, then you might as well forget about it. No, I think that the question of the relevance of these results does not depend on whether it's strictly thermalizing or not. Yeah. I mean, it's a dynamical fact. We see this in simulation, you see it in the experiment, that, that like systems which do not immediately thermalize like uh, yeah. on a really short time scale, that's a reality. Now, the I question mean, is whether that, I mean, they this, ultimately yeah. thermalize or not. That, that's a subtle and a tough question. Yeah. But, but yeah, yeah, I mean, I completely agree with integrability breaking. I mean, w we know from the quantum Newton's cradle experiment, right? Like, integrability is broken. Like, absolutely, there's a trap. You know, there are free body losses, and free body losses are disastrous, right? They break even energy conservation, yet they see something that's integrable for all achievable timescales. So, yeah, I've always taken a kind of practical approach to these things. Like, uh, I'm not sure that it's uh, meaningful uh, to worry so much, uh, as Gabor says, if things are exponentially long, does it really matter? I mean, we, we actually have worked on this integral uh, on this spin chain, which we say is non integral. <coughs> but actually, I think that there is a there is actually a nice play, playground where you can actually continuously conti um, change your energy between like the strongly thermalizing regime, where even with 
current numerical method, we, we see very nice thermalization. Mm -hmm. I mean, but, but then you, you can slightly change into some of your other states, like this X state, I think, which you have looked at, mm -hmm. which actually is, is like effectively integrable. I think yes. some, there's a yeah. paper by, by Alexei Motrunich on his student, I think, mm -hmm. where they, they look at some of these, these channels and they see this like low quasi particle density, and that might be that they derive some Boltzmann equation where they see ultimately, but there are very, very long time scales on which yeah. it looks. Yeah, so yeah. I think that might be a general picture. That I think that depending on how much energy you're pumping and which energy range of your problem you are, I mean, the, the, the thermalization yeah. length is. Yeah, I mean, certainly with the problems I've worked on in the past with pre thermalization and thermalization, this is exactly. It. I mean, we have some systems that we know are non-integrable, but for any achievable timescales, we don't see thermalization. If you really pump up the energy, uh, you can sometimes see faster thermalization. You can tune. Uh, it's. I would say, like, there aren't so many generic behaviors as such. Like, it's really a case-by-case -case basis of understanding, for me at least, at the moment. So. Do I understand correctly that there is no idea on how this, uh, I guess, thermalization for this is equation? is reached in terms of time, so the one over people reaction. Um. Yeah, okay, that's I don't have a good feel off the top of my head. I mean, see, so I mean, I have examples of system by system basis where I think I understand thermalization in those systems, but uh, uh, yeah, I don't know that this gives you a generic. I mean, as being this established by some sort of conjecture, is this a, a output of some sort of a computation? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, one would need to check the Deutsch and Shredniki papers, but I mean, this is uh, it's it's not rigorous, and uh, I mean, they have some arguments, but uh, yeah, I I don't think it's on a rigorous footing. But maybe you have no. <coughs> to the conjecture of yes. why a closed quantum system would thermalize at all. And these are the conditions that you would need. Yeah, yeah. one of the locked beam. Yeah. 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 Okay, if we have no further questions, let's thank Neil again and let's thank all the speakers in the workshop.